<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Glad to be here. Um, I live in Texas, uh, north of Houston, Conroe. Some of y'all been there. And uh, I've been working with Fishers of Men for the last couple, couple three years. Uh, Dick Polk and I, we are teamed up together. And he's the director. I'm just his, his flunky that helps him out. And also Bill Blanton with the Legacy Series. And we're, we're seeing great success down in Texas. And, um, and again, it's just an honor to be here. When they asked for me to come and share a little devotion, it's, uh, you really look at it as an honor and you start worrying about what you're gonna say. As uh, we were talking about yesterday, some of the guys up here speaking, you start going, oh no, how do I get out of this thing? But really, it's a true honor to come and, and share God's word. And so what I'm gonna challenge everybody to do this morning is if you usually take notes, take notes. If you don't take notes, take notes. Okay, because we're going to hit some points that you can always go back to and look at because if you're like me, your attention span is about 10 or 15, 20 minutes at most. After that, I'm counting ceiling tiles and counting uh, light bulbs in a building. And um, so you can always go back and remember and refresh some of the highlights of someone speaking. So take notes. Um, I got a question before we start. Let me ask you a question. Who, answer this in your mind, and if you really have one in your head that you really got to raise your hand and say, who is the most passionate person that you know? Passionate person. I'm not talking about your spouse and what happens uh, between your erotic love, but I'm talking about your passion of someone who you know when they figure it out, they laser beam on something, it's going to get done, and they're going to get it done, and they're passionate about it. Does everyone have somebody like that you can think of in your mind? Yes? This is yes, this is no. It's going to be real interactive, so we're going to talk together. All right? So let me ask you a question. What are the qualities of a passionate person? Somebody throw me some qualities of a passionate person. Focus. They're focused. Determination. Determination. Driven. They're driven. What else? Dedicated. Very dedicated. Okay? These are all attributes of a passionate person who has a goal in mind, who's trying to accomplish it, and they're going to do it. Okay? Sometimes you and I are passionate in certain areas, and other times we start waning off in our passion. Now, when we wane off our passion, we have to decide, okay, what changed and what happened? Some of the best, funnest people to be around are new believers in Christ. Worked with teenagers for a long time. You had someone get saved. They were ready to storm hell with a water pistol. Okay? They were so passionate, excited about the Lord, but then after a while, what happens? They lose their passion. Because usually Christians kind of, you know, rain on their parade a little bit and they lost their passion. I'm going to show you a picture real quick. Um, I have a, a dog and uh, it's a Weimaraner. Her name is Scout. And this is my youngest son and he's using her as a pillow. Scout was bred um, as a retriever. She's a Weimaraner and a water dog. So she'll point, she'll retrieve, and she's also a water dog. She loves being around the house. She's very content. She loves my boys, loves my family, they love her. But she is most excited when she's doing something else. Go ahead and show her this little video clip real quick. Okay, this is behind my backyard. This is not us truly hunting, but she's hunting right now. Okay? She's smelling things, she's looking at things, and if she finds something to point out, she'll sit there and hold it for a long time until I tell her, okay, up, she'll pounce, birds will fly, and that's when the fun starts. So she's content at my house with my boys, but she's passionate about hunting. Why? What makes the difference? Genetic, because she was made for it. She is doing what she was bred to do, and that's go hunting. When I say load up in the truck, boom, she's so excited. If I get any gear out at all to go hunting, man, she just starts, can't keep her in the backyard. She's so excited. She gets excited about my boys. But she's extremely passionate because she's doing what she was bred to do. As a believer, you and I, we were bred to point people to Jesus. You should be the most passionate and excited about that more than anything else in your life. And when God says, okay, go point them to Jesus, we should be like my dog Scout that just gets so excited. All right? There's my family right there. I've got five boys. One of these things is not like the other. All right? All right? That's our newest son, Adam. He came from Ethiopia about eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago. Um, he, is, he just turned nine two weeks ago. And um, he's a great addition to our family. It took us three years to get him home. He was raised up in an orphanage most of his life. He's learning English. He's learning to the culture and assimilate. And it's been a great time watching him. He does not know Christ yet, 
Well, one of the questions that we asked him when he was in the orphanage, what's your favorite Bible story? He said, I've never heard one. So anyway, so we're sharing Christ with him. We're loving him. And if you can remember to pray for us, pray for him specifically as he adjusts to our family. But again, I've got a whole basketball team here. I don't ever have to cut the grass or take the, lawn or take the trash out. It's awesome. All right. So in saying, what is your passion? And pointing people to Jesus, we have to look at the Scripture. And we are going to use 419. But to use 419, we're going to start off on John chapter 1, verse 19 through 30. Okay, so if you have your Bible, and it will be on the screen, chapter 1, starting in verse 19. All right, give you a chance to turn there. Okay, we're going to look at someone who is passionate about Jesus and who always pointed people to Christ. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent him, uh, when Jews sent uh, him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked them, are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you a prophet? And he said, no. And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? that we may give an answer to those who sent us, what do you say your, uh, about yourself? He said, I am a voice of the one crying in the wilderness, making straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet has said. All right, John the Baptist has entered the picture here. He has a big following. He has a following enough that people are taking notice, and they're gonna, they're, the, the, uh, the Pharisees and the, and the priests are asking, okay, who is this guy? In fact, they actually send a couple of guys to go find out directly from John, who are you? Are you the Christ? He goes, I'm not the Christ. Are you a prophet? Are you Elijah? Because they know Elijah's going to come back. He's like, I'm none of those things. And so John the Baptist is baptizing and leading people and directing people to Christ. All right? You and I, as directors, as men who love the Lord, we should be directing people to Christ in everything we do. But here's the key. You're not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Our responsibility is not, we cannot save, but Jesus can. And so our job is to point people to Jesus. John the Baptist says, I'm not Jesus, but I can point you to him. Guys and girls, ladies and men, we are to point people to Jesus. Now, we're going to talk about our Friday night meetings and how we can do that more effectively. But right now, just get in your mind, be more passionate about Christ and the only way to do that is to point people to Jesus. Do what you were bred to do. All right, let's keep going. He says, who are you? I'm not the Christ. Um, he also says, and he quotes Isaiah, and he says, I'm making straight the way of the Lord. What does this mean? What does he mean when he says, I'm making straight the way of the Lord? Basically, he's the forerunner. He's clearing out a path so that Jesus can step right in the middle of it. You and I, as directors, we're clearing the path so that men and women, boys and girls, can come to the Savior. Now, what does that look like? That means we plan better, we act better, we speak better. Sometimes it's difficult. We have to pull weeds. I look at like the seed and the sower. Sometimes you're throwing the seed. Sometimes you're watering the seed. Sometimes you're fending off the seed from, from other stuff that's coming in to take the seed. And lastly, sometimes you get to harvest the seed. You and I are defenders of the faith, but we're defenders of the path. We do everything we can so that we can expose men and women, boys and girls, to Jesus. And so we can be like my dog and say, boom, I'm pointing them to Jesus and I'm doing what I was bred to do. Verse 24. Keep reading with me. Now they had, now, now they had been uh, sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor a prophet? John, the, John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of his sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John the Baptist uh, was baptizing. Then the next day he saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who comes and takes away the sin of the world." Among you stands someone you don't even know. Friday night, people are going to enter the building, the church, the facility, the campground, wherever it is you have Friday night. 
And you're going to tell them, among you right now is someone that you don't even know. That person is Jesus. And that's what uh, John the Baptist is telling the Pharisees, saying, y'all are so close. He's in the building. He's here. And yet you don't know him. In fact, let me tell you how great he is. He's so great that I and you are not worthy to even handle his sandals, okay, his shoes, his dusty, dirty, filthy shoes. We're not fit to untie them. I'm not fit to untie them. And that's how great this guy is. And in just a second, I'm going to point him out. And I'm going to show you who they are. Guys and girls, we are, it's not about us. Don't let pride get in your way. Don't let the title of director, don't let the, the numbers either intimidate you or make you prideful. It's not about us. We're simply pointing. Okay, my favorite part of this whole lesson is about to happen right here. Okay, if you underline things in your Bible, if you make notes, I challenge you to make a little note right here. Okay, we're going to repeat verse 29. So the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, we just read it. We understand it because we understand Jesus and how it fits in timeline and everything else. But this is such a giant statement. This is, this is bigger than anything that John has probably ever said before. And this may be the first time that John the Baptist has ever seen Jesus. Exclamation point at the very end. Behold, there he is, the Lamb, of the, the Lamb of God who comes and takes away the sin of the world. There he is. He's pointing people to Jesus. Let me ask you a question. How was sin taken care of before Jesus entered the picture? What was it? Death. Death. Blood had to be shed. Okay, I've got, let's see, I've got a cell phone right here. Let's just represent this as sin. It could be <laughs> easy. Okay. Word picture here. I have sin right here. Something has to die. Blood has to be shed. It covers up my sin, correct? How long is it covered up for? How long? Five minutes. Five minutes. It's until my next sin, right? Okay, so I'm good with this sin until I sin again. And then something has to take away my sin again. What does Jesus, what does John the Baptist just say? Behold the Lamb of God who comes and takes away the sin of the world. Now, what's the difference between me actually taking this away completely? Now, my sin is gone. That is a huge... How long has it gone for? Forever. Big statement. Typically, what did they use as an animal to take away the sin? Lamb. John the Baptist says, there's a sacrificial lamb. And there's the one... That isn't going to cover up our sin like we've always done. It's going to take it away completely. And he says it with boldness. And, now, and he's, saying this to every, he's saying this to his followers, and he's saying this to the people who are asking, who are you? What John the Baptist is doing right now is actually taking himself out of a job. His, his, the way he sustains himself is because people's gratitude of his followers. When they get food, they give him a peace. When they get anything, they give him a peace because his job is to minister and baptize and, prom and promote the, the, uh, the life of Christ. But now he's telling you guys, don't follow me anymore. I'm done. Follow him. Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Take it away forever. You and I as directors, that is our proclamation. Friday night, Saturday morning, behold the Lamb of God who comes and takes away the sin of the world. Underline it, highlight it, mark it out, whatever you need to do to remember that is our focus and that's what we should be so excited about as directors of Fishers of Men. Verse 31. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 30 right here. This is He on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who is higher than in rank than me, or than I, for he existed before me. Stop right there. Okay, does anybody know the age difference between Jesus and John the Baptist? Six months, roughly around six months. Who was older? John the Baptist. Wait a second. John the Baptist just said, This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who is higher in rank than me, 
for he existed before me. He existed before me. He's higher in rank than me and he existed before me. What does this tell us about Jesus? He's God. He's been around. It's the deity of Christ. Jesus is God. And right here, John the Baptist is saying, okay, he, isn't, he was born six months after me, but he's been around forever. There is power in the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world, and there he is. Now quit following me and start following him. There's our job right there. Matthew 4.19 I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I'll just tell you this. Fishing's okay. It's fun. I do it. I do it a lot. Friday night is my favorite part of the entire event that we do. It is by far the favorite. Some of you may not be your favorite, but for me personally, I love it. I love it. I enjoy it. It could go for three hours. Great food, great preaching, great fellowship, great music, whatever you got going on. Going through the cards afterwards, woo, gets me excited. I love it. Dick and I, we sit there, we go through the cards, we pray, at, we pray about the cards, we talk about the cards, we follow up the next morning with those cards, and we get so excited about the decisions that were made on Friday night. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Okay, how do we make... A good Friday night, a great Friday night. We have to ask ourselves that. First of all, if we want to make someone, if you want to appoint someone to Christ, clear the way like John the Baptist said, pull the weeds out, we've got a plan to do that. We have to be intentionally planning our Friday night event. Sometimes we fail because we just simply fail to plan. I don't know what your timetable is, but I think you should document exactly at what point you want to have things accomplished. Okay? I did student ministry for about 13 years. I do mission work full time right now. And so be the best part about what I did in student ministry is I planned a long time ahead. Okay, I planned a year out. I had everything done and on the calendar by six months before an event. And I challenged us to at least do the same thing. Right now, you learned about some dates and times and figures of what the next tournaments are going to be. Hopefully, you've got those down. If you don't, you need to get back and do those. Now you need to start planning and plan for that Friday night. Saturday will take care of itself. And you guys are good at that. Friday night seems to be sometimes we've lost our passion. Have you lost your passion for Friday night? Well, I can tell you how to get it back. Point them to Jesus. Don't lose your passion. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Plan, plan, plan. Six to eight months out, be ready. Okay, when you have someone come and speak, make sure they do one important thing. What is that? Present the gospel. We are not a fishing club. We are not, we are not fishing clubs. We're just not it. We do fishing. We love fishing. We do a great job at that, but we are not a fishing club. We are a gospel presentation. We present people to Jesus. We point them to Jesus, and we clear the way so they can hear the word of God. And if you have someone who's speaking and they're not sharing the gospel, when they're done, get up and share the gospel. Right. Share the gospel. Now, it's great to have a good, dynamic, funny, awesome speaker. Those are all attributes. But if they're not sharing the gospel, it's just words. When you open the Word of God and you simply present the gospel, the clear message of how to get saved, how to repent of your sin, how to turn your life around, how it changes everything in your whole being, that is what we're about. If you lost your passion, it's probably because you stepped away from your focus of, John, of uh, Matthew 4.19. Let's get it back. Find your speaker. Talk to your speaker. Tell him what you want. Tell him how long he has. Plan, plan, plan. And if he can't follow the direction that you give him, that'll be the last time he speaks. And that's okay. Nobody's going to hurt their... You're not hurting anybody's feelings. It's just you have to be ready and planned out because we're clearing the path so people can come to Christ. All right? Um, the response. You give a clear invitation. The response. Fishers and men, we do it a certain way. We give everyone a card. It's either on their table, it's handed to them, it's some way they get a card we can document. I challenge every person who comes to our event, we need for you to document on that card because it allows us to figure out a way to pray for you. Tell them we're praying for these cards and when we see your card, we're going to be praying for you and we would hate to miss out because we don't have a card from you. How are you getting them the cards? Do you have a plan in place? Do you have a team in place? Are they going to be on the table already? Do you have enough cards? If you don't have enough cards for this season coming up, you get enough cards because that is really the only way that we document of what's happening in our life. 
Once, they, once you receive the cards back, once you have the mechanism in place with people, yourself, however you do it, they turn it into a box, whatever you have, make sure that you take those cards and those are private, confidential information. If I'm walking around and I'm collecting cards and I'm going, and I'm reading cards, which we, sometimes that happens with some of our volunteers, tell them to quit. That is confidential, private information and they're going to lose trust in you about what they write down. For us, we ask them to write down a prayer request on the back of the card, which is always great because then you have that personal connection and you ask them, even the next morning, say, dude, I saw your prayer request. I'll be praying for you this week and actually do it. Don't just say you're going to pray for them, but do it. Follow up with them that week. I prayed for you. How's it going about your job, about your wife, about your kids, about whatever? In fact, we had a guy one time uh, last season, Friday night, he shared prayer request, praying for his daughter. His wife called him Saturday morning and said, we have some really things going on. He came to me. I prayed for him. I said, you've got to go home. Forget about the fishing. You've got to get home to your daughter, hug your wife, kiss your daughter, and get her help. Sure enough, that's exactly what he did. And so guys and girls, you need to know what they're praying about. You need to know what's happening in their lives so that you can be Jesus with skin onto them. We're almost done. I'm looking at my time. We're getting close. Okay? Last thing, your closing and your follow-up. If someone comes to know Christ as their Savior, they indicated they want to know Christ, that is your priority number one. You need to follow up with them immediately. Okay? As soon as you know about it, maybe that Saturday morning, if you have time, that is probably not the ultimate best time, but if you have a chance and God's saying, talk to them right now about it, talk to them about it right now. Definitely on your ride home Saturday night, call them and find out, dude, I saw you indicated that you wanted to know more about Jesus or you asked Jesus to be your Savior. That is awesome. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to call you. I'm going to meet with you. They don't live in your town. You find a pastor of that area, a church that believes in the Bible, teaches the Bible. You call the pastor say, hey, I have a friend. His name's Joe Smith. He came to know Christ this weekend. Would you, I'm going to give you his information. Will you please follow up with him? Then you call your buddy and say, hey, I gave your name to Joe, uh, Pastor John, and he's going to call you this week. He really wants to get to know you. He's a friend of mine. I don't know if he's a friend of yours or not. It doesn't even matter. You talk to him on the phone, sure, he's a friend. He's a brother in Christ. And you say, he's my friend. He's going to call you this week. And then you, call, and then you say, he's going to do it on Wednesday because you asked Pastor John, when are you going to follow up with him? He's going to say, I'm going to do it Wednesday. On Thursday, you call Pastor John. You say, John, how did that meeting go with Joe Smith this week? You push, push, push to make sure that person's followed up with. You challenge a person, you set the date, you set the time, you set it with Pastor John, and then you make sure Pastor John did it. Because I'll be honest with you, pastors are busy, they forget, even on salvation things. Someone may have died, Miss, Miss Myrtle's in the hospital, he forgot about your buddy. You call Pastor John Thursday, John, did you see him? What happened? Push, 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 follow up, follow up, follow up. Prayer requests, pray for them. Send them out, email style. Get people knowing that you're praying. If it's confidential, it's confidential. But please do what you're supposed to do. If we don't do things on Friday night, we don't follow up, we have failed so miserably of what God wants us to do. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We come get them to Jesus. We help them be discipled, either with the home church that we're worked out of, the new church, that they, the church area that they're from, because some guys come from a long way, or you personally become that personal disciple if they don't have a church. It is great responsibility to be a director. Saturday is great. It's Friday morning. It's awesome. Love it. Are you passionate about Jesus? Where is your passion? Point them to Jesus. The last thing I want to say, do not be ashamed of who we represent. Do not be ashamed. We are unashamed about the gospel and we are unashamed about Christ. So even when it's hard, and you may not be the best speaker in the world, you might know how, what the words to say. Know that there is power in the word, and do not be ashamed to represent Jesus in everything you say, in everything you do, in everything that goes through the whole event. Represent Christ in everything we do. So plan, present the gospel, follow up, and don't be ashamed. Because we're clearing the way so people will come to know Jesus as their Savior. John 4.19 or 420, whatever it was, 429. Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Point it out. Take away your sin through Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us real quick. Father, we come before you. God, we're just so grateful that you allow us to be directors, to be helpers, to be ministers of the gospel for you. God, I pray for every division in this room. God, I pray that many people come to know you as Savior. We pray for great turnouts in many boats. 
But God, we pray for the hearts and souls of the men and women, boys and girls, who are going to enter the Friday night event and hear a clear message of your word and truth. God, I pray for every heart in this room. God, I pray that you allow us to, to spend time with you daily. We pray for the families that are represented here. God, we pray you comfort our families as we're not with them right now. But God, when we get back home, let them see a passion in our hearts because in our families, in our friends, and in our ministry, we are going to point people to Jesus. God, we love you, and we praise you, and we give you all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Larry.